You're going to have thousands of situations with your son where you're going to be disciplining him, guiding him, showing him the path, and you can either do it in a warm, loving way, or you can do it with judgment. When you think of your parents, do you think of somebody who guides you warmly, or do you think of somebody who judges you? If your parents are somebody who, when you think of them, you think, well, they judge me, do you want to be that for your son? going to do a Rising Father podcast. I'm going to go live. And I'm really, really excited about what I'm talking about today. I was going to go live about one specific um, topic. And then I said, nope. As soon as I thought of this one, I said, this is it. Like, this is the one I'm going to do. And that is how to build an unbreakable bond with your son. And I have an unbreakable bond with my son. He's about to turn 11. And we've got an unbreakable bond. That's one of um, you know, it's one of my joys in life is the relationship with my son. And I've got an amazing relationship with my wife and with my daughter as well. And we'll save those for another podcast. Today is about how to build an unbreakable bond with your son. And I started, I was going to be like, you know, three ways, five ways. And as I was making this uh, list for you guys... I have 20 ways. I just kept on writing and writing and writing and I had way, you know, strategy after strategy and just thinking about my life and the relationship with my son. I was like, oh no, we do that. We do that. Yeah, that's important too. That's important too. We just had our Men of Fire program, Brotherhood Call. And we were talking about how to connect with family members. We were talking about how to be a good person and that really feeds into this. And I just can't wait to dig in. I don't know how long this one's going to be. <laughs> it might be a long one. So hang on as long as you, you can. Um, but this is a really special podcast for me, a really special topic. And it's just how to grow an unbreakable bond with your son. So let's get off. Let's, uh, let's start. Number one, do things with them, whether you like the things or not. And that can be a hard one. For example, I was with... Uh, Nathan, this past weekend, while well, Lauren and my wife went to uh, New York City, they went there for the weekend, and just me and Nathan the entire weekend. Some of the things he wanted to do were not fun. Some of them were fun. Like, I love playing catch with the football. I love playing basketball. Um, I love watching movies that I like to watch, you know, but he wanted to go in the basketball, or sorry, go in the backyard and take a bouncy ball and just bounce it back and forth to each other. Not the most fun thing for me, but he wanted to do it, and it was fun for him. So purely, sounds really simple, guys, but just spend time. That's number one. Just spend time with your son because it does not matter what you buy them. It doesn't matter what you give them. They just want that time. Nathan told me a story this weekend of one of his friends who, you know, their parents make a ton of money. They're very wealthy. And his son was telling Nathan, or, yeah, this boy was telling Nathan, one of Nathan's friends was telling him that, he's like, I wish my parents wouldn't give me so much stuff. He said, and he's real honest about it. He knows why. And Nathan was like, what do you mean? He's like, well, they give me iPads and they give me switches and they give me the Oculus. He's like, I have everything. He's like, they just give me so much stuff. I don't use any of it. And Nathan asked him why. And he said, because they're never here. And he, this kid is almost 11 years old. Also, he's Nathan's age. And he told Nathan, he's like, yeah, they just buy me stuff because they feel bad that they're never home. He's like, they're always at work. And this, this 10-year-old boy understood that. He has another eight years to live with his parents. He's like, they just, you know, they're wealthy, they're doing well, they just buy him things to, because they want, they want him to be happy, they want to see a smile on his face, but they're not willing to give him a thing that will make him happy, and that is just their time. So the first one, very simple thing, do things with your son, whether you like it or not. Some of those things will be fun for you, some of the things won't, but what matters to them is that you are there with them. 
Number two, start hobbies that you can both do together and grow together. I am so happy I did this. I remember when I started Rising Father, it was my very first post, like three or four years ago. It was a picture post, and I said, I think it was probably how to connect with your son. And one of the things I said was, start hobbies that you can grow with your kids. And I talked about jujitsu. I thank God I started jujitsu with my son four or five years ago, however long it was. I think four years ago. We do it. We get to spend an hour together three times a week. We get to build a skill. We get to get in shape. We get to get strong. I get to take him to tournaments. I get to coach him. It's fun watching him. It's fun participating. It's win, 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 win. We got, we went to the ADCC tournament in Las Vegas. We watched 10 hours of jujitsu one day. Not a single complaint from him. He was upset that he left. He is obsessed with jujitsu. And I am too. And because of that, we now have a shared interest that for the rest of our life, we can share together. We're going to go to a master class um, by Marcelo Garcia about a month from a month from now. We've gone to a Gordon Ryan master class together. This is something that we can do together forever. So start hobbies that you can grow together. We started archery. There's an archery range by us. It's free to the public. We've been shooting some arrows. Basketball. We play basketball together. Um, he loves drawing. It doesn't matter. Do things. Start hobbies and things where you and your son can grow together, spend time, challenge each other, and can never be taken away from you. I could do jujitsu when I'm 70 years old. There's guys, I know there's guys in my gym and other gyms who are in their 70s. So I, I've got 30 plus more years of doing jujitsu with my son. He's going to be able to kick my ass in a little bit. Not in a little bit, maybe in, what am I, 37? We'll say 20 years from now when I'm 57. He'll be able to kick my ass. Unless he gets cocky and stops thinking about technique and then I can technique him. But we can always talk about it. We can always share this together. Number three, listen to him. Some of these might seem simple, and they are, but they're simple things that we don't do. A lot of the things that are simple to do, they're also very simple not to do. And that is just listening to them, not looking at your phone when they're talking. Our kids know when we're present and when we're not present. And when you are staring at a screen instead of listening to them, they know. At the end of the night when it's time to tuck them in in bed and you know you could rush out of the room, just spending five, ten minutes in there one-on-one -on -one saying, what did you go through today? You know, last night, the kids went to bed late. It was like 9.45. Usually, they, I want them in bed by 9. And Nathan said, he's like, Dad, can I read to you? And I said, yes. I wanted to go to bed. I wanted to be in bed by 9 also. But I said, yeah, you can read to me. Didn't want to do it because I, be I wanted to be asleep because I had to get up in like six hours. But I knew that I'd regret if I didn't say yes. So I said, yes. Sat there, he read three pages of like a comic book to me, tucked him in, went to bed, and made him feel better. And then I felt better. I, I didn't have regret going to sleep at night. Also, after he was done reading, he just opened up about his day and talked to me about different things at school that were bothering him. And sometimes whenever we have a lot to do, you have a lot on your mind, um, you can push that out. You can create... Um, too many things in your brain to where you're not present with the people around you. You're not really listening to them. Like your son wants you to be there for him. He wants you to listen to him. Really listen to him. Put the phones away. Put all the distractions away. Just set aside time to where you can actually just let him go, let him be free, and find out who he is. And the more he gets older, the more you can lose track of who your son is if you're not putting that time away. In a couple of weekends, my son and me are going to go camping. He wants to go on a man camping trip. He can't wait. I can't wait. We went to Vegas a couple months ago. Four nights, unbelievable. Had so much time just talking together, finding out who we are as people so we can develop that unbreakable bond. You need time. It's one thing you can't get back. Nothing is worth buying that time away from your family. 
always invest time. Keep the most valuable asset to the people who matter the most. Your time is your most valuable asset. So do not sell that to anyone else. Give it to your family. Give it to your son. Next, encourage him. Always encourage your son, whether you feel like he deserves it or not. Because there's going to be times when you are judgmental and you say, well, you know, I need to come down on my son right now. No, encourage them. If you have an encouraging, positive attitude with your son, he will appreciate that. He will love you for that. You will become the person that makes him feel warmth and loved. So be that for your son. Be the one he goes to for encouragement. You could be that. You could be that light for your son. You can be the one that he always goes to for words that make him feel good. What if that was you? Like anytime he's down, he comes to dad to feel good. You could be that for him. Speak words of encouragement all the time. Next, don't judge him. We talk about this a lot in my program, and that is <clears throat> how to guide, how to be a light, how to discipline, how to have standards without judging. It's hard because a lot of times things disgust you. Someone might do some, maybe your son does something that disgusts you. And he says a word that you don't like or repeats probably from something you said or something you saw on YouTube or TV. And you want him to stop that behavior, but you don't want to cast judgment upon his character. It's hard to do. It's hard to just acknowledge the situation that happened without casting judgment upon who they are as a person. Because in one of those situations, you're guiding an, an interaction, you're guiding a behavior. In the other situation, you are describing who they are, and then they start to believe that, and they start to believe you believe that about them. So that's a very powerful thing that we can do to our kids. So here's an example. I'll try to give you an example. Say your son repeats something he saw on a YouTube video that is really inappropriate. You could say two things. You could say, Nathan, do not say that. That is inappropriate to say in his house. Or you could say, why did you say that? You are disgusting. The second one casts a horrible judgment picture onto who they are as a person. The first one addresses the situation. We all don't only do that to our kids. We do that to our wives and lots of people. So address the situation. Do not cast judgment upon the person. Now, why is that important? Because you're going to have these situations come up in your life thousands of times with each person in your family. You're going to have thousands of situations with your son where you're going to be disciplining him, guiding him, showing him the path, and you can either do it in a warm, loving way or you can do it with judgment. Do you, When you think of your parents, do you think of somebody who guides you warmly, or do you think of somebody who judges you? If your parents are somebody who, when you think of them, you think, well, they judge me, do you want to be that for your son? You have the option. You can discipline extremely effectively and guide and change someone's life really effectively without making them feel bad about themselves, without casting judgment upon who they are. This is not easy. These are goals that we strive for. Like I said, on today's call, we were talking about the man we want to become. Who do we want to be? This is one of those things. Like, who do you, How do you want to be remembered? Do you want to be remembered as the judgmental dad? I don't want to talk to dad. He's going to think he's going to judge me. Or I can come to dad with anything. He's going to guide me with warmth, with love. I can spill my heart out to him. Anytime I fail, I can come to dad. He will guide me. His arms are always open. So do not judge your kids. Discipline them, guide them, do not judge them. What's next? Smile. I told you these were going to be simple. Smile. If you recorded yourself throughout the day, how much of the day would you be smiling? When you're interacting with your son, how much of that time would you be smiling? How much of that time would you be scowling? How much of that time would you be looking away? 
simple thing. If you only did this for the next 30 days, how would the relationship with your son change? Oh, the only thing you focused on for the next 30 days was smiling more when you're around your son. Do you think your relationship would change? Do you think his impression of you would change? Do you think there'd be more love? <clears throat> Excuse me. <laughs> Do you think there'd be more love, more respect? Do you think he would think more fondly of you? If you just really focus this next month on purely smiling more, I bet there would. How about every time your son comes into the room, you just smile? So when he thinks of you, he thinks, Dad smiles, not Dad's stressed, Dad's anxious, Dad's frustrated again. Dad smiles. My dad smiles all the time. Every time I see my dad, he's smiling. When is my dad not smiling? Is that how your kids think of you? Or is it, man, dad is always going through a rough time. Yeah, but my, yeah, my dad is always stressed out. My dad, I, I got to give my dad some space when he comes home from work. I, I, you know, I, I don't talk to him that much. You have the choice of how you're going to be remembered. You have the choice of how your son will think of you. Simple. Try that for the next 30 days. Smile more. Next, be somebody he admires. Maybe the most important one and the whole message of Rising Father and the purpose of our coaching program is be somebody your son admires. It is one thing to spend time with them. It is another thing to show them a path to a successful life and to become someone they want to be. I shared this on our call this morning. My son went to school yesterday and one of the things they had to do was they did this quiz where the this computer program told them what profession they should be i don't agree with that but that's what they had to do i think every single one of us had to do that at some point useless and the point of it is probably to get kids to just try harder at school but nathan got matched 60 60 percent to be a doctor i can tell you that is not going to happen if he was my heart surgeon, he'd probably leave a scalpel in my heart. <laughs> when he walks into the door, his backpack is right inside the door. Amazing at some things. Organization right now, not one of them. We're working on it. But he wrote down on his sheet after he got that score, he said, I don't want to be a doctor. I want to build a business like my dad's rising father business. He said, I want to start a program for men, and I want to help them be the best they can be. That's what my son wrote down. I'm not making that up. I'm not lying to you. That's what he wrote down. And I was taking a walk with him yesterday and he took a picture with his iPad and showed me. He was so happy to show me that he wanted to impress me. He said, look what I did. He wants to be like me. That is a huge win, massive win for my life. Now it's my responsibility to continue to be that. I'm 37. He's going to be with living in his house for at least eight more years. So for me, like, until I'm 50, I'm still going gonna, gonna to be a ripped grandpa. I know that. But I need to continue to push myself and be somebody that he admires. If I allow myself to slip and become someone my son does not admire, that'd be a devastation. There'd be a massive failure on my part. Our relationship would suffer. My son does not look up to me. Look up to the person he should look up to above everyone. The person he should respect. The person who's guiding him. When he thinks about what's possible for his life, he looks to his father. He says, Dad did that so I can do it too. So I can't quit. I can't allow fear and doubt to pull me down. I have to become my best physically, financially, with discipline, with my relationships. I want him to see I want him to see me doing the dishes in the morning for my wife. So he does that with his wife. I want him to see how I treat the family members. So I have to be somebody he admires. That is maybe the most important way you can improve the relationship with your son. There was a guy who was in our program um, back when it first started. Very first, we had like five people. One of our very first people. And he had kids in their 20s. And he said, you know, he's like, it's not too late for me. I want to... I want to change relationships with my, with my sons. They don't respect me. 
you know, was a thing. He said, they don't respect me. He was really open and honest about it. He said, you know, I've let myself slip. I'm lazy. I have no discipline. I sleep in. Um, it's like I play video games. I shouldn't be playing video games anymore. He's, he was a business owner. He's like, I know I can be doing more. I know I can grow more. He's out of shape. He just said, I am not. My kids do not respect me. And because of that, they don't listen to me. Like they, they challenge me on everything. They see me as themselves. They don't look up to me. So be somebody your kids admire. Be somebody your son admires. A lot of this stuff you can transfer to your, your daughter as well, obviously, but the title is son. Um, treat other family members well. I mentioned this. You are being watched all the time. One of the best ways you can gather respect and admiration from other people is purely by them watching how you treat other people. It's the same thing as when you're at a restaurant, you're talking to a waiter, you're talking to um, someone who's cleaning your hotel room, you know, a cashier. Your kids are always watching you. They're going to mimic you. How you treat other people is massively important in how they respect you and think of you. Whenever you're living at home and your wife is there and your daughter's there, Whoever is there, your son is watching you interact with them. If you treat them really well, he admires that. He respects that. He loves you more. The more you love your wife, I guarantee that will translate for your son's love for you. I remember growing up and when my mom and dad were, you know, lovey with each other, it just it made me feel warm and loved inside, seeing my mom and dad so in love. When you do that with your wife, when you do that with your daughter, and your son is there watching, he just loves that. Even with a, even with our dog, I can, I know it. It's a, silly, maybe stupid, yeah. But our little Brittany Spaniel Rusty, I know when I'm lovey dovey with Rusty and I'm cuddling him and playing with him. If I look over and Nathan's watching me, he's there watching with a big smile on his face. Same thing with if I'm like that with Lauren, with my daughter, and you know I'm just cuddling her and making her feel good. If I look over at Nathan, he's there smiling, watching. You are being watched all the time. So how are you treating everyone else in your house? Next. Let him pursue his own interests. This can be hard. You know, I, I want to guide him and have him start things that we can do together. Yes, but also he can pursue his own interests. I'm not going to force him to do anything. I may show him some things that I think are good for him. But he can say yes or no, such as I want him to start wrestling. He does jujitsu. I think if he started wrestling, it would really help out. You know, his takedowns and some of his just body motions, it's really great exercise. He doesn't want to do wrestling. I'm not going to force him to do it. It's okay. I want him to be him. When I was a saxophone major, the most talented kid that ever came to our school quit after six months because he got burnt out because his parents wanted him to be this prodigy. A, prod a prodigal saxophonist. Yes, there is such a thing. But he quit because he couldn't handle it. He couldn't handle the pressure that was being put on him. Nathan is allowed to, to pursue his own passions and interests. He does not have to be me. He does not have to do what I do. He does not have to follow my lead. doesn't have to. I want him to be passionate about his own thing. He's passionate about tennis shoes right now, which I couldn't care less about. He's also passionate about the NBA, which I also couldn't care less about. But I'm letting him do that. If he wants to pursue a career that is something that I'm not interested in, he's welcome to do that. But when you give them that space to grow on their own, they feel more comfortable with you. There's not that tenseness. There's not that coldness between you and your son. So allow them to grow independently, and they will come to you. The more you try to latch on, the more you try to hold them close and control them, micromanage them, the more they're going to want to run away and flee. Let them go, let them grow, and they will want to be around you. Next. Help him in the hard times. Be there for them. Once again, be there for them. Your son is going to go through some really hard times with friends. I remember the first time Nathan... I remember the first time Nathan realized that other people can be mean. He went to school and some kids made fun of him because he had, 
think red hair or they something like that and he he was crying and he you know it was it was heartbreaking for me as a parent because up until then you kind of create this bubble and you create this world where everything's perfect and you give them everything they want and you raise them and you love them and then they, when they go out into the world they see that people can be mean your feelings can get hurt it happens and those are some small hard times, but they're going to go through greater hard times. Nathan is going to hit middle school. He's already talking about girlfriends in middle school. And in high school, they're going to get their heart broken. They're going to get fired from jobs. They're going to go through some really hard times. As a child, their hard times are different than your hard times. To you, they might not seem like a big deal, but in the kid's world, they are a massive deal. For a kid getting a nasty comment from who they thought was their best friend might be as, as devastating as you losing a massive client. It might make you feel the same way. So be there for them in the hard times. Let them talk. Give them space. Give them time to just spill their guts and just let them know you're there. Once again, do not judge. Next, love him as he changes. Your son, as a baby, is adorable. As a toddler, is cute. As a young, as an older toddler, is funny and hilarious. Then maybe they get to middle school and they get a little annoying and obnoxious. <laughs> I was a middle school teacher. And then sometimes they grow out of that, sometimes they don't. But they still want you. You're still their father. Find the parts in them that you love. And understand that they're trying to find themselves. They're in the most chaotic, insane time of their lives as they're growing up. Are you going to leave them because they don't make you feel a certain way? Are you going to treat them differently because they are changing? Because they do not make you feel a certain way, are you going to treat them differently? The answer has to be no. As they change, continue to love them for who they are. They should get the same expressions, the same love from you, same affection from you as my son is in fifth grade as he did when he was two, three years old. And I do that. Gets the same love. It can be challenging at times because he's louder, stronger, more chaotic, does more damage. He's 100 pounds now. When he runs and jumps on me, I tell him not to. It hurts more than when he was 30 pounds. So you have to master those emotions and control them. But as they change and go through hard times, continue to show them love. Next, physical affection, cuddle them. I still cuddle my 10-year-old son. He's about to turn 11. Like I say, he's 100 pounds. He's up to here, up to my chest on me. He can break my arm in jujitsu. But this morning, sitting in my office chair, before he leaves for school, he comes over, sits on my lap. I give him a kiss. I rub his hair. Since the day they were born, we have been extremely affectionate with our kids physical touch i just i also knew from my teaching background and the research that we had to do in college and growing up in a massive family that physical touch actually changes a child's brain the connections in their brain the chemicals running through their body you can literally make a child smarter and more happy and confident by giving them physical affection, by touching them, by by rubbing them, by hugging them, by giving them kisses, by cuddling them when they're toddlers and babies. You literally change their biological makeup. It's a real thing. You also just fill them with love and you make them feel loved. So I, how can I improve the relationship with my son? Physical affection. Now, if you haven't done this for a decade and you go 100% today, it might not work out. But you can start to gradually work that back in. But if you're doing it right now, don't stop. Next, more love than discipline. You have the option when your son screws up to come down hard or to come down warmly and sternly. At the end of your life, you're going to want to look back and you're going to want to limit the amount of blow-ups you had. You're going to want to limit the amount of hurt feelings that you gave out. 
So you're going to want to remember yourself in a controlled, stoic manner in being warm. Yes, you can discipline. Yes, you can guide. But you don't have to do so in an uncontrolled, judgmental, mean way. So offer more love than discipline. And guess what? It works better. If What is the end goal of discipline? The end goal is that their behavior is modified in the way that we want. Right? They're doing something you don't want them to do. So we want them to stop doing that thing and do the thing we want them to do. If you warmly encourage them and show love in the positive areas of, your, of their life, they will do more of that thing because they want more warmth and love. So at the end of your life, you can, I want you to look back and say, I offered more love than discipline. And you might not agree with every single one of these things, and that's okay. I don't think you should. Never accept 100% of what anybody says. I'm just telling you some lessons that I've learned from my life so far, and maybe you can take something from them. I did not get a degree in father-son relationships. I'm just sharing my life with you. Limit the amount of blow-ups you have. Because those blow-ups, though infrequent, hopefully, and though the amount of time they take up in your life is very small, the amount of time they reside in your son's memory is very large. If you have a powerful blow-up that lasted one minute, your son will remember that for eternity, for the rest of his life. Because during that blow-up, feelings are hurt. We often say things we regret, and we cast judgment upon their character. And the words we say during those blow-ups craft the story your son thinks that you think about him. Dad thinks I'm an idiot. Dad thinks I'm dumb. Dad thinks I'm a failure. Dad thinks I always screw up. Those thoughts come from these blow-ups that we have. So limit the amount of blow-ups you have. How do you do that? You have to practice mastering your emotions. You have to practice being in control of yourself. It starts all the way back to uh, the discipline that you have with watching what you eat, watching what you drink, going to the gym every day, waking up on time. Mastering yourself with the basics transfers to mastering your emotions in those blow-ups because it's all the same muscle. Whenever you allow yourself to explode, it's just a lack of physical control. You've not practiced the hard way. You've practiced giving in to pleasure and lack of control. So limit the amount of blow-ups you have. Do manly things with him. Okay, Do manly things with your son. My son said in the spring, Dad, I want to go on a man trip with you. So we went to Vegas. We rode dune buggies. We you know, walked through the casinos and resorts. We walked up and down. We did push-ups on the bridge. We had a great time. We're going to go on a camping trip in a couple of weeks. We're going to light fires. I let my son um, shoot, do archery. I let him do dangerous things under guidance. You know, The other day, he was just practicing making fires in the back. He likes doing manly things. Your sons like doing manly things with you. Whether your dad did that with you or not, do that with your son. He needs it. Next. I smile when you see him. Okay, Every time you look at your son, just greet him with a smile. It's just a good habit to get into. It costs you nothing. right? It's um, Jim Rohn talks about giving people profits. He says, if you have profits, just spread them amongst as many people as you, prof as you possibly can. Having, giving people smiles is like profits of your good life that you're living. So just give that to people. Give that to your son. When you see him, see, as soon as he walks in the room, smile. You just become the person that smiles. Make people feel good. Eye contact. Told you these would be simple. Not hard. Easy to do, but very easy not to do. Put the screens away. Eye contact with your kids. Eye contact with your son when you're talking to him, when he wants to really share something with you. A lot of times we say, man, these kids are always on the screens while both parents are on the couch looking at their phones. Eye contact with your son. Simple thing you can do. Next, real world experience, less screen times. Real world experience, less screen time is what I'm trying to say. The other day, my um, son said, hey, let's go watch a movie. And I said, and I made a podcast about this, I think, the last one. So let's go watch a movie. And I said, no, let's go on a hike. 
So we went out into the woods, went on a hike. We ended up, you know, sliding down waterfalls, and we spent about two hours out in the woods. He had an unbelievable time. Lauren, who was there, came back and said, um, like, that was my favorite day I've had. So she really loved it. I know we're talking about sons. Um, but try to limit the amount of screen time and do real-world experiences with them. Archery, jujitsu, basketball, taking on hikes, going on walks, soccer, whatever you, golf, whatever you can do to get out and actually do real world things with your kids. That is what matters because in that you have moments of connection that you don't get. I still watch movies with my, with my son. We still do that. I still play video games, but I try to limit that. I try to make our real world experiences far more than the screen time. Never break a promise to them. Still never done that. It was it. I remember when my kids were very little, talking to my wife about the importance of this, just I never want to break a promise to them. Because once you start breaking promises to your kids, you, do, you erode that trust they have in you. Then little bit by little bit, that crack grows bigger and bigger and bigger. Then they stop listening to you. They stop respecting to you. They stop respecting you. And the words you say have less weight. And you are less of a person in their eyes when the things you say don't matter. Even the small promises. Like I told my son we would go camping. Do or die, we're going to go camping. It's already October, so we're running out of time. I don't care if I have to take him out of school on a Wednesday. We're going to go camping for a night. I told Lauren, I said, what do you want to do this summer? Write down 10 things. She wrote down 10 things. And I looked at, before I promised I would do them, I looked at them to make sure I could do them. And I said, okay, we can do all those 10 things. We did every single one of those 10 things this summer. She said, I'm going to go camping. I remember running out of time in the summer. I said, all right, you and me are going camping. Me and her, we went camping for one night, got it in. Had an amazing time, one of her best nights of the summer. She loved it. Never break promises to your kids. Small promises too. That includes threats that you make. If you are somebody who, are all, who is always making threats to your kids to get that's your way of guiding their behaviors by threatening them and then you never follow through then you are eroding the power of your words every single time you do that you must keep your promises if you threaten if you say if you throw that baseball you can't play on the switch the rest of the day guess what if he throws it they can't play on the switch the rest of the day that is keeping a promise to them if you say if you get five a's on your report card i'm going to take you out to dave and busters they get five reports A's on a report card, you take them out to Dave and Buster's. I don't care what you have. You cancel it. You have to keep your promises to them. Your word is everything. Lastly, never lie to them. Never lie to your kids. You've got to be on the same page with this with your wife. You can, and there's some times when we don't tell them things. Like there's many times when me and my wife are talking and it's not for Nathan's ears, and we'll say, go upstairs, this isn't for you. But if he asks what we're talking about, I'm never going to lie to him. I will say, I can't tell you, but I'm not going to make something up. And there's a million little situations where you have the option to lie to your kids. And I'm not talking about, is Santa Claus real? But whenever you get into the habit of breaking promises, of telling little lies to them, that most important asset you have in any relationship, trust, is destroyed. So do everything you can to not lie to your kids. 20 things. 20 ways that I think are very important for my relationship with my son. That's how I'll put it. Those were 20, um, 20 bullet points that I have found are extremely important in why I have a great relationship with my son. Pick one of them, pick all of them. It's up to you. But I would also love to hear what your, um, what is valuable to you and in your relationship. So if you're like, email them to me. If you're listening to this on our podcast afterwards, you can put it on a comment or if this is posted to Instagram or whatever, you can put it on there too. But this is a really important topic for people is fathers connecting with their son. And you can even just pick one of these things and really hone in on it over the next 30 days and massively improve the relationship because it means everything to them. 
Something as simple as smiling when they enter the room. Cost you nothing, might mean nothing to you, but it means everything to them. And then they go to school and they're thinking about dad who's going to greet me with a smile. I can't wait to go home. And when they're feeling alone and scared and weak, they'll have that image of their warm, loving, strong father to comfort them. And more kids need that. You know, this is about you, but it's about your kids. It's about your son. It's about filling them with light. And that is our job as a father. It's to be the giver of energy, be the giver of strength, be the giver of light. Give that to them. Hope you enjoy that. Hope you got something from that. Let me know how you connect with your son. And this is the Rising Father Podcast. Please subscribe. I'm trying to get to 1,000 followers on Spotify. I didn't even know followers on, followers on Spotify was a thing. Apparently, I got to 154,000 on Instagram. Great. I'm at like 70-some on Facebook. But apparently, there's followers on Spotify. And I just found out whenever I transferred my hosting to Spotify. So, hey, if you're listening to this, follow me on Spotify. By January, I want to get to 1,000. Thanks, guys. See ya.